This is one of my favorite shows of the entire year. We go through every single team that missed the playoffs and spotlight the one move that they must make this offseason. Hayden, basically, uh, we are fixing the people's franchises out there. But we're doing it in a realistic fashion. We just can't say every team needs to upgrade their quarterbacks because they do. But there's a certain segment where I said, okay, they're not getting a quarterback upgrade no matter what. Yeah, you will notice a theme here. Maybe, I don't know, the first 10 mm -hmm. teams all uh, basically need the same fixes. And it makes sense why they might be the bottom 10 teams in the entire league. Um, I don't know what Hayden's going to say in this, by the way. We each brought our own notes to the table, vice versa. I'm going to give a little state of the franchise here to open with each team. Obviously, we'll go in NFL draft order. And if you think we screwed up on your team, the best place to let us know about that is in the comments down below. We are doing our best here. And obviously, all cap figures are an estimate at this point. But Hayden, again, uh, I love the show because the offseason can be, to me, just as fun as the regular season. Yeah, I love the first couple months of the offseason, kind of resetting where each one of these teams are. Okay, let's kick it off. Bears. Chicago Bears own the number one, number nine, and number 75 overall selection. $60 million available in cap space right now. Hayden, that's about the sixth most across the league. They fire play caller Luke Getze, along with the quarterback's coach, running back's coach, wide receiver's coach. Hayden, what is the move they must make? Well, I'm already... A under the assumption that they're going to be drafting Caleb Williams. So I'm going to take it one step further than that. I want the Bears to find another wide receiver. Ooh. I looked at this. DJ Moore was a fantastic trade last year. Cole Komet has popped off. Their success rate when Justin Fields was throwing to those two receivers was at 61%. Throwing to everybody else on the roster, 39%. That is not good enough. I think Cole Komet's a nice check down option but darnell mooney's a free agent they have not really invested at the wide receiver spot they try to chase claypool i think they want to get serious you just named all those draft picks that they have they oh, also yeah. have a little bit of cap space use one of those other first round second round picks maybe the justin fields trade if they get a second round pick try for another wide receiver because caleb williams watching that usc for the last couple of years he distributes the ball to everybody you need multiple stud wide receivers to make playoff runs at this point, and why not surround Caleb Williams or Drake May or Jaden Daniels or even Justin Fields with another weapon? Okay, I, I like where your brain's at. Can we, re we rewind just a couple steps? Yep. Is it even a discussion about what this team should do with the number one pick and with Justin Fields? I think, obviously, you have to listen to the trade offers on both sides of it, but I do think that Justin Fields is just not shown enough. I think you can win with Justin Fields. You can squeak into the wild card rounds. Could you win a Super Bowl with Justin Fields? Not right now. I think he's a great uh, asset to trade for if you're in quarterback purgatory. The Bears aren't in quarterback purgatory because they have the first overall pick. I am with you. I will say the entire, I'm not going to say entire, the majority of the Chicago Bears fan base is in the camp that they should now build around Justin Fields and once again deal this pick. So I think we are almost combating them with our conversation mm -hmm. here. I am with you. To me, this is a very different feeling I have about, let's even say general manager Ryan Poles and this organization at the moment versus how they're even talking about the number one overall pick versus where they were last year. Just take this quote that I found in his press conference, quote, in my mind, I'm going to take this all the way to April. That was when asked about the number one overall selection. Meanwhile, last year discussions first started with the then Houston Texans at the NFL combine. So I think Ryan Poles now understands that we have seen some progression from Justin Fields. Is it enough progression? Not in my mind, right? We still we still love Justin Fields. It's awesome to have the best athlete on the field at the quarterback position, but and he has definitely progressed as a passer, but the pressure to sack ratio and how that destroys drives to me is still a massive issue and that's mm -hmm. not even factoring in how you can almost reset the course of your cap situation, your roster with starting with the rookie quarterback. And on top of that, Hayden, I think it is noteworthy that they have basically reset this offensive coaching staff. Yes. You can kind of look at that in two ways, and it's a bit of a Rorschach test. But to me, that leads into, are you really going to put a Justin Fields in his third new offense in four mm -hmm. years, or are you just going to restart with a new quarterback? I read it the same exact way. Eberflus's defense has been good enough down the stretch since trading for Montez Sweat. He's going to run the defense. He's going to hire somebody, maybe like Shane Waldron coming from Seattle. He focuses on the offense, and then in comes 
whatever first overall pick they want. I think that will ultimately be Caleb Williams. They're in a pretty good spot to with having a defensive minded head coach now finding their offensive coordinator. Some of these other decent play callers, let's mm-hmm. put it, are in these awkward situations because their head coaches have been let go. I mean, again, you mentioned Shane Waldron. I'll throw in Kellen Moore's name. There are probably going to be a couple others that pop up here that uh, are definitely intriguing options, despite, again, having a defensive minded head coach. Okay. We would go the number two overall pick, but Hayden, before you know they get shoved into the garbage bin, let's go to the team that uh, technically has the number one overall selection. Panthers. Oh, the state of this franchise. Let's reel it off. Pick 33, 65, 97, $34 million to spend. We know that the head coach, general manager jobs are definitely open. I think Hayden just reading between the lines that they want to keep Edgero Evero as defensive coordinator. What is the one move the Carolina Panthers must make this offseason? I think for the coaching staff, like you said, I do think that Evero should stay. And I think a coach like Todd Monken or offensive minded coach try to help with Bryce Young is coming. But what they also need to do is it's time to trade Brian Burns. He's technically a free agent. They have the franchise tag at the disposal. We've seen historically some of these big edge rushers get traded after being franchise tagged. We've seen it like four or five times, like the last five years. And most of the time it does come with edge rushers. Brian Burns does not seem like he loves being in Carolina. More importantly, though, this second season is so important for Bryce Young. You have to at least be able to evaluate him. And I would trade Brian Burns for a draft pick picks that they are missing right now. And you cannot find wide receivers in the free agency free agency. Your best bet is finding someone like Adam Thielen, which only gets you so far. I would trade Brian Burns. Trust your defense coordinator. Who's one of the better coordinators in the league. They have some other assets on defense and you got to be able to evaluate Bryce, Bryce young. And I think the easiest way for them to do that is this 33rd overall pick. Hopefully a wide receiver falls to them that they like, but maybe you can get a first or a couple seconds for Brian Burns. I think this is the time to finally move on after turning down a lot of draft capital right. for him multiple seasons in a row. You know, I think trading Brian Burns now would really frustrate Carolina Panthers fans because, as you said, it was two first round picks plus that the Los Angeles Rams offered for him back at the trade deadline a few years ago that Scott Federer turned down. And then the other part, and this might not be totally fair, I'll create a world where it is. They could have included Brian Burns in the deal last year instead of DJ Moore. And looking back on it, they absolutely should have yeah. done that. I mean, Brian Burns isn't like the easiest way of putting this, simplest way of putting this. Brian Burns isn't just going to walk away for nothing. Like they either give him a long term contract, franchise tag him, or tag and trade him. Um, to me, what the Panthers need to change this offseason is turn awful positions into average ones. Okay. They played eight right guards this year, seven left guards. Brady Christensen, Austin Corbett returning from injuries could potentially help those interior spots. I still think Bradley Bozeman sucks at center, and we know that Icky regressed at left tackle. But the big spot to go from awful to average is at wide receiver, and namely that speed and reliability Mm -hmm. on the perimeter. Like, I think people often jump a few steps in this when you're this bad of a roster status at those important spots where they're like, we've got to get the best. We've got to look for a franchise staple. I cannot tell you how big of a jump it is to go from literally league worst to just league average, because what that does is it gives you a chance on any given play rather than multiple spots, giving you a chance to tank any given play. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? And I think there were plenty of occasions this year when you watch the Panthers that it was a cycle and rarely did you have, the offensive line holding up appropriately to go along with the quarterback uh, having a pocket and making the correct decision to also on top of that, having the wide receiver create separation and then the wide receiver catching the football all in the same play. And you watch other teams and then it happens frequently. Yeah. Looking at this, they were dead last in their 20 plus yard receptions. They were 29th in their deep target catch rate. So I'm right there with you. Why not trade Brian Burns for somebody like that? It, m- maybe like the best free agent that will come available for wide receivers, like your Marquise Brown types. Like that would be an upgrade that we're talking about. You're not going to hit the home run unless you draft them though. So that's the problem right now sitting at 33rd overall. Um, so I think it's just time to flip some of these defensive guys over to find hopefully Bryce Young's new number one wide receiver. And look, we, we have seen teams without a spending a first round selection on it 
create an explosive and good wide receiver room, a tight end room. I mean, you can look as far as the Green Bay Packers for that, yeah. right? But you have to have scheme to fit that in. You have to have good talent evaluation skills to fit that in. And it's stuff like T Higgins is obviously, and we'll talk about this going to hit free agency, but like the next name you mentioned, Hollywood Brown, we'll talk about that in a moment, but like Darno Mooney is after that, or like yeah. Noah Brown is after that. It gets so thin at yeah. wide receiver this off season. Commanders. Holders of the number two overall pick, the 36th overall pick, the 40th overall pick, 67, 96, 98. I mean, Hayden, that is six spots in the top 100 where the commanders are selecting right now to go along with, I think, around $78 million, the most in the league available to them. We know that they fired head coach Ron Rivera, obviously their general manager as well. They have a lot of resources to do it. What move must they make this offseason? Their move is to just make it rain. You're Josh Harris. You're worth $7 billion. <laughs> he was patient with the 76ers. Remember, that was, that was a Sam Hinkie era. Trust the process. They finally got their Joel Embiid. Well, good news. They have the second overall pick. They'll find whatever Drake May or Jaden Daniels, maybe Caleb Williams to fall into their lap. But I think it's time to make it rain. Get the GM that they want. It sounds like they're down to two guys. Uh, one of them is from the 49ers front office, actually has connections to this Warriors advisor that they talked about, but I would expect them to be very analytically minded. And I think this is a huge opportunity for the commanders just to press reset. Obviously, oh, they yeah. will get the quarterback that they want. They will get, I think, whatever head coach that they're kind of looking for. And it sounds like they're leaning towards more like the Ben Johnson type, just talking about the Warriors and the 76ers, where they're from. It's all about analytics, offense, that type of movement. That's why they're not even pursuing Bill Belichick. So I think they're going to go offense here. And the good news is you have Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson as a starting point. The defense, I think they're going to completely keep tanking there and they're going to build offense. But I just think it's a good starting point to bring up Josh Harris because to me, this is the first time where they're actually resetting as a franchise post Dan Snyder. I'm totally with you. You and I see eye to eye. Like this really might be the best reset in recent NFL history, a league that like tries to allow for competitiveness and parity every single year. Teams typically aren't in positions like this. New owner, new head of football operations, new coach, new quarterback. It's all on the way. And I just love how quiet they're kind of going about it, but like quick in the same way where they're the first team that is now down to basically two to make all of these football decisions. And I love Ben Johnson. If they want Ben Johnson, Ben Johnson should take this job. Again, yeah. Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson are absolutely two starting caliber wide receivers that you can do a whole bunch of things with. Sam Cosme is really like your one building block along the offensive line. That's great. You at least have one. And as you said, people are going to look and point to this defense and say, well, they're going to have to spend all this money and a lot of these draft picks on defense. That's not how you do it. Build this offense and build the defense over time. You know, for agency, some mid, late round draft picks. You can do a few early ones as well. But look how much you had invested in the first and second round along that defensive line. And look at the results that it gave you. So much of it is finding the right defensive minded defensive coordinator to put players in roles that fit the talents that they have. And you can do enough to win games in that department. So I think the commanders should be the most coveted job. And I understand like these potential head coaches probably have not watched Jaden Daniels or Caleb May or mm. excuse me, Drake May or Caleb Williams at all. That's fine. I'm sure they're going to have their preference. And if they like one of them, they should take this number two overall head coaching job. I agree with you. The chargers will spend a lot of money. They actually have Justin Herbert. Obviously we know that Tepper is going to be spending money, but this guy, Josh Harris, he's got the cash and it's time to make it rain. Get Ben Johnson. Patriots. Don't typically find the Patriots up this high. Stay of the franchise, pick number three, pick 34, pick 68, pick 99. They have the second most salary cap, I believe, available as well, roughly $71 million. We know that Bill Belichick is moving on. We do not know if his successor is going to be Gerard Mayo or someone else, a la Mike Vrabel. Hayden, what is the move the New England Patriots must make this offseason? You got to take a chance on a rookie quarterback. So I think there is a top three. It does seem like Jaden Daniels and Drake May are kind of battling for that second spot right now. Obviously, way too early to tell. But like we just said with the commander's defense only gets you so far. The Patriots defense was really good this year. And Bill Belichick could still coach really well on that side of the ball. 
it just doesn't really matter all that much until you find the upside play. So obviously Marvin Harrison is going to be right there for them. He's going to be such an elite prospect as well, but you're playing that game. Who would even be throwing him the ball? So I think it's time. If it's Mike Vrabel, bring Ryan Tannehill along and then draft a Jane Daniels. But I think you have to play this bridge quarterback in there to start the off season and then take the chance on the rookie quarterback easily they can bust even marvin harrison he can be an a lights out prospect but i think you have to play for the upside at this point so there's two ways of doing this that we've seen in in recent history right it's take that quarterback number three and in that case it's somewhat similar to what we got with anthony richardson last year which to me was definitely worth the mm -hmm. number four overall pick and in any given season anthony richardson could have been the number one overall pick that's just my interpretation of his skills but I don't know if every single team that's going to have to take that third quarterback will fall in love with the third quarterback. You know what I mean? Typically, it's one that you love one or two and not all three. But that's one avenue. The other avenue is it's going back a few years now, shockingly, but the A.J. Green, Andy Dalton dynamic where you take A.J. Green early and then take the second rounder in Andy Dalton. And that's definitely a possibility here. But hey, and I'm with you. Overhauling the entire offense is the way to go. When you just look at who is getting paid mm -hmm. on this team, there are two offensive players in the top seven on the salary cap that take up the most money, right? Those two are Juju Smith Schuster, who has no knees yeah. and literally can't get on the field, and David Andrews. Right. Like this roster on offense is so bad. And like the obvious moves to me that you must make is bring back Michael Owen Wu and, you know, bring back Cal Duggar, but the roster is in rough shape. And this is an entire, uh, maybe the biggest reset that we have seen from a winning coach to what they will be in the future. Um, and I understand Robert Kraft and Bill Belichick not wanting to do it together because mm -hmm. it would probably be a near impossible situation versus what the expectations have previously been for the last 20, 30 years. And unfortunately, in this division with the Bills and the Dolphins and hell, even the Jets next year with Aaron Rodgers and potentially beyond, the bar is really high. So that's why I think, especially for the Patriots, you have to swing for the fences at this point. If, if the third overall pick busts, well, guess what? In two years from now, maybe you have a little bit better weapons and you'll play this game again. Yeah, and there's a ton of veterans that are free agents and about to be Hunter Henry, Trent Brown, Kendrick Bourne, Slater, Cal Duggar, Josh Uche so on and so forth. So like picking the right ones to bring back while obviously picking in some different pieces. We know that there have been so many uh, coordinators that have gone on to have head coaching jobs next where mm -hmm. next elsewhere from this team. And we'll see if they can, you know, find the right one to come back. I, I bet they do. I'm excited for Patriots fans to be in this moment for them because obviously these like the post Tom Brady era has been weird and awkward for them. I still right. think that they kept the expectations when you have this much of a reset and really everyone is out the door, like truly. And you start from scratch to me, that is when like another wave of kind of fandom mm -hmm. fanaticism sticks with you and creates within you when you're attached to teams. Yeah. I don't feel bad for Patriots fans. They won six. <laughs> Super Bowls. I'm sorry. Cardinals. Arizona Cardinals pick four. Pick 21-ish because they have the Houston Texans number one selection, 35, 61. They also get the 71st overall pick because the Will Levis trade up. Pick 86, pick 100. That's a lot mm -hmm. of ammunition for this Cardinals team with also, I think, the, around the ninth most salary cap available, $51 million. What move do the Cardinals need to make this offseason? This is a team with draft capital and cap space and – a franchise quarterback. So what do you do? You take the easy route. You draft the generational prospect. Marvin Harrison's there. You scream up to the podium because last year, the Arizona Cardinals, they were 30th in their deep ball catch rate. They were 28th in their explosive passes. They were actually really able to run the ball. James Conner also with this offensive system, also with Kyler Murray. That's going to be totally there. The check down opportunities with Trey McBride plus that is already there. They have to win down the field that's the missing ingredient right here on offense and marvin harrison malik neighbors pick your favorite guy up top they drafted the tackle last draft now it's time to get kyler murray the deep threat because i think kyler murray, murray on the move that touch he has his arm strength down the field we haven't seen that in a little while and they're gonna have to make this decision on marquise brown but even right. if you do bring back marquise brown you're taking marvin harrison or malik neighbors 
I think the Hollywood Brown conversation is going to be a fascinating one. And we're going to get it well before the draft, yes. right? This is going to happen even before free agency opens with this team. Because while hit or miss, he's been, and sometimes his fault, sometimes not, injuries. And obviously, quarterback play that is sporadic because of injuries to his own quarterback. It, it's never been worth the first round pick that they paid for him. And despite what we saw with him and Lamar Jackson as this downfield vertical threat, and despite these guys being friends, we really like <laughs> never got that vertical element right. between him and Kyler Murray ever consistently. With that said, if he hits for agency, other than T Higgins, Hayden, he's going to be the highest paid yep. wide receiver in for agency. And so like, I think in your mind, you have to understand, okay, Outside of the number four overall pick, and we don't know if that is going to be Marvin Harrison Jr. He might be gone at number three overall. Are we okay with the rookie and then the likes of Rondell Moore and Michael Wilson opposite that? Because to me, if you bring back with the salary cap that you have, Hollywood Brown, if you draft a wide receiver at number four, you have Trey McBride, who is featured in this Kevin Stefanski-esque offense. You mentioned James Conner. This has to be, on paper, one of the most fun offenses in the NFL. And I don't know if many people would say that about the team that is selecting at number four overall. They have the franchise tag available for Marquise Brown. It's pretty expensive, like $21 million. But wide receivers, when they hit the actual open market, they get paid a lot. So why not? This, you got here a little bit quicker than most people expected. It seems like the tackle they drafted last year is a really good player. And the Kyler Murray contract, it's really not that bad. Like once you sign that contract, a couple of years pass by. If Kyler Murray can return to where he was, this team will be competing for wild cards uh, as soon as next year. Yeah, it's it was fun to watch this team in Monty Austin Fort during like the behind the scenes videos that each team puts out on YouTube because mm -hmm. we mentioned all the draft picks that they have in the top 100. He would just was like constantly on the phone. Like there were compilations of that that they put out there and. I mean, going from Steve Kime to this, and then obviously what Jonathan Gannon is giving off and how this team was feisty, spicy, whatever descriptor you want to use for them. It must be a very different feeling that you have, despite being maybe in a similar place, picking in the top 10 as a Cardinals fan versus how it has been, let's say, in the previous four or five years. Chargers. Pick five, pick 37, pick 69, pick 101. Uh, Hayden, this is the first team on this list. And again, they're picking at number five. That has real salary cap issues. Right now, they are $35 million over the cap. That is fourth worst in the NFL. So just quickly, if you can cut, you know, the likes of Khalil Mack, Joey Bosa, Mike Williams, Corey yeah. Lindsay's probably going to retire, Eric Kendricks, that puts you about $40 million in the positive. But then that's close to only 32 players under contract. Again, you got to get up to 53 and even to 90. Um, new head coach, new journal manager, a big task ahead of them. It really is. And also when you cut all those players, those are all of their good players. Uh, so that's going to be an issue. So what I want them to do is I want to pretend that the Quinton Johnson pick just didn't happen. You can't, you can't assume that he's going to be part of the long-term plans Keenan Allen is aging. They're for sure not going to be able to afford Mike Williams. Josh Palmer, we know who he is, a starter-level player, probably a number three, maybe a number two wide receiver. So just get Justin Herbert another guy. You need a true number one. You need somebody that can win down the field. It's been years that we've been complaining about that. Still is not uh, solved yet. So there's a bunch of wide receivers, Malik Neighbors, potentially Marvin Harrison if he's still there, Roma Dun Dunzier. All these guys are available. I would surround Justin Herbert with a, the number one wide receiver for the future because I think that Keenan Allen, while he was super productive for fantasy purposes, you can't really bet on him long term. And there's even chance when they interviewed Keenan Allen after the, the season, he was like almost saying like he's a trade candidate. Oh, interesting. Um, I'm with you again from a salary cap standpoint and cutting a bunch of veterans who have performed sporadically. I mean, you can put Bose up there. You can put Cleo Mack up there. You can put Mike Williams, right? Sporadic is the right way. Mm -hmm. I'm actually okay getting rid of people like that because that is what free agency is. That is what, when you find veterans on the market that previously have names to them, it's because they're declining and overpaid. And all those guys are overpaid for what they're giving you on the field, despite what Cleo Mack put, that, put out there. Um, I'm with you. They need to spend the number five overall pick on an offensive player. 
You need to make your strength stronger. You know, make this a top 10 defense in 2020 or top 10 offense in 2024. I really think you can, you know, Justin Herbert, Keenan Allen, Josh Palmer in the final year of his rookie deal, Rayshon Slater at left tackle, Zion Johnson. Hopefully you take a bigger step here in year three. And that's enough. Like that is the core. If a good play caller comes in here that you can have a top 10 offense in the NFL and then defense, guess what? You spent on it last year. You still suck because you haven't learned to tackle. Just learn how to tackle this off season and maybe be close to league average mm -hmm. in that area. So I, again, I want to stress that this is being termed a really bad situation to walk into. I am not of that opinion. I think that this is not a poor situation to walk into despite the cap situation, despite the cap spot, because again, just this core of offensive players that you have, you can win some games in 2024, especially if you're a quality play caller, and then you just move on from there. This is an attractive job to somebody that wants a lot of control, like Harbaugh, for example, because they just reset with their general manager as well. So it's Curious to see if they're going to go. I'm guessing they want to go the veteran head coach route after going with Brandon Staley previously. So like the Dan Quinn types, Pete Carroll, John Harbaugh, uh, or Jim Harbaugh. I think these are the type of names that should be linked to Los Angeles. Would you hate it if this number five overall pick was an offensive lineman instead of a wide receiver? It would have to be go to right tackle. Right. Um, typically centers and right guards aren't drafted this high. So yeah, if there's an, a right tackle, I'm not sure if there is in this draft, but I, I have watched some Malik neighbors. So that guy, that guy's pretty good. <laughs> I have not. And I have watched a lot of Quentin Johnson. And I just want to say that if that selection hit to the degree of a Jordan Addison or a Zay Flowers, I actually think that this would be an even easier conversation to have. Yeah. Because, but since it didn't, and since you can literally have zero expectations for him, mm -hmm. um, it makes again that number five pick at wide receiver in play. Because again, if QJ hit, right, that is the heir apparent to your priority number one target that Keenan Allen, if he leaves, let's say in 2025, then he takes that throne. Maybe you bring Josh Palmer back in like a mid contract of what he might show this year. And then you go on from there. But since you can't, and if they don't spend this number five overall pick on a wide receiver, then you might have to start like completely fresh at that spot in 2025 when it was previously the strength of your team. The new head coach and new GM will not care about Quentin Johnson and his draft capital. Giants. Interesting one here. Pick six, pick 39, also get pick 47 because they dealt Leonard Williams. Pick 70, they have around $33 million available last time I checked. Uh, a new defensive coordinator on the way, though, after yeah. <laughs> Wink Martindale resigned after a shouting match with yeah. Brian Dayball. Offensive line coach was also fired. 2023 did not go the way that Brian Dayball and Mike Kafka wanted it to. What moves they need to make in 2024 to make it better? Well, they can't get out of the Daniel Jones contract. I think what they just need to do is they have to get serious at pass catcher. They've made some efforts recently but they're all half measures. The trade for Darren Waller, that was a hundredth overall pick. Didn't pan out, obviously, due to injuries. This year, Wandale Robinson, that's a good slot player. We know what Wandale Robinson is. He's going to be productive there. Jalen Hyatt, he is a third-round pick, deep threat. You have the foundational pieces in the secondary tertiary options. You got to get a number one wide receiver. And yep. now's the time to do it. These are the drafts to do it. I don't care if it's a little bit of a reach to draft one of these guys. Let's say neighbors and Marvin Harrison are off the board. Just reach for one of these first-round receivers. They don't hit free agency ever. It's a time to actually evaluate Daniel Jones with Dayball. Dayball is coaching for his job. He had the injury excuse this year. You're not going to be able to run that excuse back next year. you got to get Daniel Jones a serious number one wide receiver because we just have not seen that before. Yeah, you and I are in lockstep here. Um, there's having Daniel Jones be their starting quarterback in 2023. They won with like, game situational success in 2022 and with that quarterback mobility that they heightened and spotlighted to me the offense was going to expand down the field a bit more broader mm -hmm. attack blades of grass with the additions of like jalen hyatt and specifically darren waller and with the andrew thomas injury early on and then the daniel jones injury on top of that it completely derailed everything to me we never even got a peek at one of what they wanted to be no. heading into this year because I think they wanted to be different than what got them into the playoffs in 2022. Joe Shane at his end of year press conference said, quote, we will address the position when it came to quarterback. 
Um, two neck injuries and an ACL now for Daniel Jones. Maybe they bring back Tyrod Taylor. Maybe they take a guy with one of these two second round selections that they have and see if he brings something to the table here. But I was so excited for this team because I think Brian Dayball and Mike Kafka can coach because again, they were winning and, and highlighting the, the areas, the strengths that certain players did have. But at some point they just like hit the talent ceiling that a lot of those pass catchers brought. And like one primary dude would truly actually give them a chance. And I think be able to allow them to flex some creative muscles, some like legit NFL offense muscles that it's felt like the last two years, they weren't able to do that. Yeah. Then beyond that, they also just have to like get on the same page. Like you said, with Wink Martindale and Dayball, they weren't on the same page. Saquon Barkley was like, didn't even have his end of season recap. He says, you know how to get a hold of me. If you want to actually give me a contract <laughs> offer, like they just need to like also clean up what's going on. I'm, I'm with you. And Evan Neal at right tackles, a uh, big conversation to have Andrew Thomas at left tackle. He had a pretty oh. rough rookie season, figured it out during the end of that, but he's outstanding. And then obviously they were shuffling a lot of pieces in those two guard spots and center too. So who knew that Hayden in this top seven that we talk so much about wide receivers mm -hmm. and offensive line play. It's pretty important when you're trying to build franchises. It's true. Titans. Speaking of Tennessee Titans, pick seven, pick 38 and uh, pick 102. They do have the fourth most cap space roughly at around $71 million. They fired Mike Vrabel. Quote, we didn't want to wait to trade him because that would put us behind weeks in finding the right guy. <sighs> Tennessee Titans also the reset button. What do they need to do this offseason? They need to draft the left tackle of yes. the future, and I would do that in round one. More half measures recently, and I think it's one of the reasons why the Titans have not been uh, very serious, at least this last year. Uh, they have Peter Skaronsky at left guard. I think that you want a one-two tandem on the left side that you can run behind. They're going to obviously be moving on from Derrick Henry, but you need to be able to evaluate Will Levis. It sounds like the owner that she really likes, Will Levis, I don't think that Vrabel liked Will Levis, and that's part of the reason why they're out of there. But it's been a weird spot with ownership over here, too. And I think it even goes back all the way down to the A.J. Brown trade, and there was some speculation that they wouldn't have uh, the cash on hand to give A.J. Brown. That's why he gets traded. That's why Vrabel wanted out of here. And it makes me a little bit nervous when you're just talking about someone who inher inherited the team, kind of calling the shots uh, by herself and... I just don't see like the direct path right now because it seems like Rand Carthon didn't have any say in the Mike Vrabel firing either. Yeah. Always on my radar when the team owner records a separate video after firing former coach of the year and really beloved head coach mm -hmm. in Mike Vrabel. And she just does a four and a half minute edited video with the team's in-house media and then sends her general manager up to the wolves the yeah. beat writers, including like Paul Kuharski <laughs> uh, for 37 minutes. And Ugh. when she even says, no, I didn't consult with him. And then he has to basically speak for the franchise. That's a Tough. rough situation, That's rough tough. situation for an owner to put a decision maker into. And to your point, Amy Adams Strunk said, quote, we have a promising young quarterback. Those are about seven of the 37 words she said <laughs> in that entire 40, four and a half minute video Man. she had. So to me, you have to, in some way, try to put Will Levis in a situation that he succeed in. And we know he has a bazooka, right? We know he can unleash these passes down the field. But you can't do that if your left tackle is a turnstile at times. And then, you know, even their starting center, who played near 100% of the snaps this year, is a free agent. Obviously, they have a very good linebacker in Alshair, who is also a free agent. But you need two building blocks, at least, along the offensive line. You have that in Skaronsky. And bringing a left tackle just to give you a chance on offense is the right path. But Hayden, he has flaws. Mm -hmm. But Mike Vrabel, I think everyone can say that he's a talent elevator because of the culture, the mindset that he brings to a team. So I'm quite nervous about what this team might look like if they don't and aren't able to find a talent, you know, uh, elevator in in week one of his coaching presence. I completely agree. There's just no face of the franchise. Just really weird timing because this is the offseason you're moving on from Ryan Tannehill, who's been there forever, and Derrick Henry, who had that really emotional presser. 
and they just don't have a face of the franchise right now. Falcons. Pick eight, pick 43, maybe another second rounder if the Jacksonville Jaguars re-sign Calvin Ridley this offseason and pick 74. They have about $21 million in cap space that Atlanta Falcons do. Hey, did you know this? They only have two winning seasons in the last 11. Wow. Yeah. Arthur Blank, Rich McKay were up at the press conference. Terry Fontenot was not to be seen afterwards. That also put some things on my radar when the owner, the president go up there for an hour and a half, and then the general manager does not get a say in anything. Anyways, what move or moves do the Atlanta Falcons need to make this offseason? Well, I, I do think that Bill Belichick is a high candidate right here, and maybe he wants the control, and maybe that's why Terry Fontenot no, uh, is not out there. But I think that the move that they need to make, and this will be a little bit controversial, is I want them to sign Russell Wilson to a veteran minimum contract. <laughs> and the reason why I wanted to bring this up, and this is to me the right landing spot for Russell oh, Wilson, man. is his contract has offset language, meaning all of the money that the Broncos owe him uh, it would be offset. So it doesn't matter at all if Russell Wilson only signs the veteran minimum, which is $1.2 million. Well, when you're picking eighth overall, I'm assuming that Jaden Daniels is not going to be there. You don't have many options. And for Russell Wilson, all of his Correct. faults out there, he can do some things. He can throw the ball downfield and he can run this little play action offense. And while you have B. John Robinson, Kyle Pitts, and Drake London and a good offensive line, I think that's the right environment for that. And more importantly, the bar is low in this division. Russell Wilson, let's say he's the 20th best quarterback in the league, somewhere 25th over there. This division is completely up for grabs. You don't have to swing for the fences here. You can easily make the playoffs next year with Russell Wilson. And if it's going to cost you $1 million, which I think it will, I think this is the right landing spot for him. Okay. This video might be outdated in a day, but let's just take a walk down theoretical lane. Okay. Yeah. Let's say Bill Belichick is hired here right? Maybe theoretically his play caller is Josh McDaniels once again. Okay. Do you think Josh McDaniels and Russell Wilson are going to see eye to eye? Like that is my thing. I understand Russell Wilson is not the worst quarterback in the league mm -hmm. right now, but as we just saw with Sean Payton, you have to work around Russell Wilson rather than work with Russell Wilson. Now I am totally with you that the Falcons are in this quarterback purgatory state where you can't really trade up there's probably not going to be one in that spot that you're absolutely in love with, albeit it's very early in the process. So would you rather live in the Russell Wilson world? Would you rather trade for Justin Fields, the Ryan Tannehill, the Jacoby Brissett, the Sam Darnold, the Jimmy Garoppolo markets? Like that is what we are working in right now with the Atlanta Falcons. And I don't think that Bill Belichick has to hire Josh McDaniels. Maybe Bill Belichick hires somebody else, but Bill yeah, Ryan, like who? Th these are his dudes. Yeah, for sure. But I just think that Looking at the the players that are around Russell Wilson in this hypothetical build, it is the right environment for the they have the at least the pieces that like, kind of to me fit. it doesn't matter anymore. Like yeah, I, I don't know as many choices, like you said though. I'm yes. Um, I just think Russ is like the quarterback who he is at this point. I do want to bring up, despite us talking about it for the other eight teams so far, offensive line is not an issue for this team. Now, did they play worse this season than they did in 2022? 100 percent but you're bringing back all five starters along the offensive line. And they are absolutely good enough, especially with the right coaching to be a top 10 unit mm -hmm. in the NFL. That is rare to have for a team picking in the top 10. Also, it is rare to have talents like B. John Robinson and Drake London, and hopefully a more healthy Kyle Pitts and selecting at number eight overall. It's just a case here though, that, Typically, Hayden, to me, this would be a spot where a team should go all in for a quarterback. I don't think anyone's getting up into that top three, top no. four in order to get one of those players this year. So it's like Justin Fields, who comes with his warts, and then everything else. And it's a fascinating dynamic to be in. So I just dropped the bomb on you. What, what is, what's your fix here? I mean... I would prefer if it's a one year thing to have Ryan Tannehill over Russell Wilson. Mm -hmm. That that would have been I've been begging for that. I know that for made a year. more sense with <laughs> Arthur Smith, who actually coached him. <laughs> well, I, I don't think I don't think Mike Vrabel wanted to give up Ryan but Tannehill. Do you think Ryan Tannehill is better than Russ Wilson straight up right now? Yeah, I don't, and I think I think Russ Russ will be cheaper than Ryan Tannehill. One note before we move on from this team: 
low key, they should keep defense according to Ryan Nielsen on the staff. I understand if Bill Belichick gets hired, that's not going to happen because obviously he and Steve run the defense. Right. But if another head coach comes in here, we have seen defensive coordinators stick with new head coaches, especially if they're offensive minded. I think Ryan Nielsen, what he did in year one with very little on that side of the ball, AJ Terrell, obviously Grady Jarrett missed half the season. Clayus Campbell's 37 or 38 years yeah. old. And what he did with a bunch of these other pieces to me was very, very interesting. And so we've talked about with Shane Waldron and Kellen Moore and these other play callers that are now trying to find jobs. If your team is looking for a defensive coordinator, I know it was only one year, but I think the energy and what Ryan Nielsen showed on the field, he should be open to some of these yes. other defense coordinator jobs if that's not with the Falcons. They were 12th in EPA per play, and they were dead last in pass rush win rate because they didn't have the juices at edge. So eighth overall pick, draft the best edge rusher too. Jets. The number 10 overall pick and the number 72 overall pick. A measly $4 million in cap space this year. Also, no coaching changes, Hayden. It's almost like this team is scared really? to make any moves. I wonder why that would be. Yeah, um, this I don't want to go down that path. It's too obvious. So I'm just going to say, let's make it easy. Just draft a left tackle. I mean, the Makai Becton stuff just didn't work out. He was at least on the field this time around, but he had a ton of penalties. The Jets, according to PFF, they had one offensive lineman with a grade over 55, which is not good. And that was Elijah Vera Tucker, who's coming off a torn Achilles. So they don't have any offensive linemen. You don't, you don't have really the luxury to upgrade your backup quarterback because the cap situation that they're in, Aaron Rodgers coming off of this injury, his age, you at least got to protect him. I think that Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson are enough at the skill positions to get by, assuming that Aaron Rodgers can get some of his guys, maybe Alan Lazard bounce back season, but you can't go into this year with this offensive line. What they need to do this offseason, and I'm more speaking to the fans, is just pray to whatever supreme being you believe in. <laughs> okay. Because they've changed nothing. And they right. can't really change anything other than hit on pick 10, pick 72. Because as it stands right now, the New York Jets staff, the New York Jets front office are proven losers. Yeah. And they're just running it back. Because they're able to hang injuries and Aaron Rodgers, above all else, they're being controlled by this quarterback. And what he wants is what he gets. We saw it last year with, I know he denied it, the short list of players that he wanted. Alan Lazard, healthy scratch for his end of the year. Randall Cobb, Dalvin Cook, Billy Turner pops up here, right? I'm with you. The one spot that they have to fix is they have to find a left tackle because even dating back to his quote-unquote healthy time with the Green Bay Packers, that final year, it was not good because he did not want to get hit. The ball was mm -hmm. out quickly, and that's why attacking the middle of the field was not there. It was either short or throw it deep. And so to have a chance this year for Aaron Rodgers to play 17 games, your offensive line has to drastically get better. The issue with that is I'm with you. Their best offensive lineman who is very good in Elijah Vera Tucker, a significant injury he is coming off of. Joe Tipman now will be in his, I believe, second season at center. And then all these other pieces, like you had hoped for Mike, Mikai Beckton to come around. Nope. Now he's a free agent. Max Mitchell is most likely a swing tackle. And then Lincoln Tomlinson, you spend a bunch, bunch of money on, and he's going to be locked into one of these starting jobs. So you have to nail it. You know what position it's going to be. And so does everyone else. Uh, over under $13 million to David Bakhtiari this off season for <laughs> Rodgers. <laughs> I mean, he didn't play this year either. <laughs> I know exactly. He's injured Perfect too. Fit. Perfect fit. Like, I do not want this team. I understand how it can be glorious and it can be so much fun and it can work for certain games. I don't want this team to go out and try to get Devontae Adams this offseason. Like, no, no. They need to put their resources in a way to protect the offense that they have. And the offense that they have is Aaron Rodgers. And we have seen ever since, even if they go and get a veteran quarterback to back up, which is what they are planning on doing, the offense is the offense because of Aaron Rodgers. And Nathaniel Hackett can't call it. Like, yeah. And the other part of this, I mean, the rest of the league, again, knew what the Jets needed last year. That's why teams trade up and get some offensive linemen ahead of them. Um, and so you draft Will McDonald, who was missing for about half the season because he was inactive. And now the guy that was playing over him and Bryce Huff is going to get paid by someone else this offseason. He's a really good player, and obviously no Jets mm -hmm. fans want to lose it. Again, maybe this is a bit over the top, an exaggeration. 
they're being held hostage. And he, Aaron Rodgers is the most important band in this organization. And it's just amazing to me, not outwardly, but as you can read between the lines, they are just cowering down to him Mm -hmm. consistently. It's one of 32. It's incredible. I haven't witnessed this in a long time. Vikings. Minnesota Vikings picking 11, 42nd, and 104 overall. They have about $36 million in cap space. Uh, Hayden, the obvious move that they must make is getting a Justin Jefferson contract. Anything else you want to add here? I'm resigning Kirk Cousins to a one to two year deal. And you're in quarterback purgatory. He's there. And when your offense was good, it's hard for me to move on. So they were six in EPA, fifth in completion percentage over expected. Kirk Cousins was seventh in PFF grade. He averaged 7.4 yards per pass attempt with Justin Jefferson on the field. You have Jordan Addison out there. The offensive line has really played well. We know that Kevin O'Connell could really scheme this thing up. It sounds like Brian Flores, he's going to be interviewing for positions, but it doesn't seem like he's a front runner for any spot. So I think he's going to be back. Your best path is to just hope you can get hot with Kirk Cousins. Uh, I saw him without his shirt off. Uh, without his shirt on, he was doing the clap. He looked in excellent shape. Obviously, it's scary coming off that injury. But seriously, what are your better options here? Sign him to a one- to two-year deal. Don't commit long-term. If you can get him on a one-year deal, I would try that. But your best bet right now is to run this thing back and see if you can get hot. I had a good authority last year that the Minnesota Vikings decision makers were very intrigued by the top three quarterbacks. Obviously, they couldn't get up beyond the number four overall pick, so it was ended up being pointless. They're probably going to be in the same situation here. I am with you that they are in quarterback purgatory. Quasi was asked about it in his postseason press conference. He said, quote, can you find an agreement that works for both sides? That's the difficulty, but it's my intention to have him back here when asked about Kirk Cousins. Okay. Um, I think that they have viewed the quarterback landscape and free agency and realized that Maybe even though it's not meshing a hundred percent of the time that a off a significant injury, Kirk Cousins is definitely their best. But Hayden, what I find difficult about this team is that Kevin O'Connell and this coaching staff, including Brian Flores, is too good for them to ever be uh-huh. in like a top three or four overall pick situation, as we saw last year. Uh, as we, I mean, three different quarterbacks were starting the second half of the year mm-hmm. in Josh Dobbs, Jaron Hall, and Nick Mullins. They were still somewhat competitive, kind of winning games in unconventional ways. And to me, that stands out with coaching. So, like, you have to hit on either a quarterback that other people have dealt and gotten rid of their garbage and you turn it into your treasure, or you have to hit on a second round plus quarterback. And that's super difficult to do. But I wouldn't be opposed to sign Kirk Cousins to a one to two year deal. And then if Michael Penix is available 50th overall, that's what you want to go with. Sure, that's fine with me. That's probably the best way to attack this. Yeah, I'm with you though. Kevin O'Connell, he's too good. Brian Flores is too good to get yeah. up there. And I think that's why you just have to hope that you can get get lucky and Kirk Cousins stays healthy and they can get hot. And we might see a better version of Jordan Addison. That can be like a le- very, very legit well, one-two punch. The other part of this, too, is TJ Hawkins is coming off a significant injury on top of it. Um, one I want to add is I want to give Brian Flores more defensive pieces. Yes. Because whether that be at like corner or pass rusher, Denell Hunter is a free agent. So is Marcus Davenport, who was a previous free agent splash. But, mm-hmm. you know. Brian Flores did some really cool stuff with like Josh Metellus and Ivan Pace and some of these no namers. And so what if he got some like awesome talents to go with it? And it yeah. could be super creative on both sides of the ball. Well, the good news, we haven't talked about defense with any of these teams. So they're probably going to have the best <laughs> corner or edge rusher in the draft available to them. I mean, seriously, pick 11 out like it was in the Justin Fields, Mac Jones, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson. Micah? The, the first piece was JC Horn. Oh, and that's that right. was, yeah. I believe, pick nine. So this year, the first one might be pick 11, if I'm remembering that correctly. Yeah. That's also the year that uh, your boy put up the greatest mock draft of all time. <laughs> <laughs> Broncos. Pick 12. No second rounder because they gave it up for Sean Payton. And uh, pick 76. That's it in the top 100 for them. They're already $30 million 
over the cap. Hayden winks. And I don't think that even includes the move that is going to happen with Russell Wilson here. They're going to eat so many millions of dollars. They're going to spread it over the next two years, most likely, but it will be historical dead money with moving on from Russell. And my advice is just to look inward, accept the rebuild. It's coming. Don't try to middle this thing. Don't try to get a veteran quarterback. I would keep Jared Stidham, trade for like Mac Jones, trade for Kenny Pickett, get young as you can. I would try to trade back. I would try to trade some older veterans and I would actually restart the, the rebuild. This team does not have a chance to win with their current setup because of the dead money that's going to come in here. So I would like them to take a swing on Jared Sidham and Mac Jones. If those guys completely suck, well, guess what? Maybe next year there's a Quinn Ewers or another top prospect available. So I would completely lean into the bit. Sean Payton, you know you're not going into anywhere for a long time. It's going to be hard for him to do that. Obviously, he's trying to win now, but I would really try to reset. And I think that if you're the general manager, which could be a new guy over there, I would really try to get young and reset for the next offseason. Do you think that might be difficult for Sean Payton? Um, I mean, yes. he has to do it. He, <laughs> right. he has to. There is no other choice that they have have here. But like you have this rough season that you open with just one win for so many games. Mm -hmm. And then next year, you're basically going into it being like, hey, we might be competitive. And maybe at best, we are back in the 12th overall selection. Do you think Sean Payton, who you know was out of the league doing some media stuff, will then want to go back into it in like, year three and then year four. And you think he's up for a rebuild? Like, I mean, they gave up uh, multiple draft picks to get him. And now he has to totally reset. This isn't a situation that we got with like, you right. know, a John Gruden trade right. where, oh, you walk into a great situation that you can take the Super Bowl. Well, I hope that Sean Payton looked at this Russell Wilson contract and knew what he was getting himself into. Assuming he's a smart guy. He yeah. had to know that this was going to happen and that he has to build for the long term. A lot of Jaleel McLaughlin, a lot of Marvin Mims, so here's a lot my of question. those types this year. Could this be a Justin Fields situation? Or is it kind of circumventing the resetting of the entire roster right. building process to trade for a guy that is in the final year of his mm -hmm. four-year rookie contract and then plus the fifth-year option on that? Because as soon as the fifth-year option kicks in, you're basically right. not getting the salary cap stuff anymore. I'm not even sure if they can afford Justin Fields for this year. I think yeah. that's, I think it's like Jimmy Garoppolo or the Mac Jones types and stuff. So just take your medicine and like really, really eat some shit this year. <laughs> well, they need to resign center Lord Cushenberry because if they bring him back, they're actually five highest snap count players from last season were the same starting five offensive linemen. That's rare. Mm -hmm. Like that's a very healthy group. Not saying like they're all the best, you know, there are certainly some players that you can improve on. Guess what? You can't improve off on them this year. So just like bring that cohesion back in a Sean Payton system to me would be a step in the right direction. Yeah. They just need building blocks, you know, yeah. like for the long term, Jerry Judy is not going to be in this team, you know, building blocks for this team are Patrick Sertan and Justin Simmons. And that's kind of yeah. it. Yeah. It's not, it's not a whole lot. And, I don't think Justin Fields and Sean Payton, they're not they're not destined for each other. Just no. I'm with you. I just want to, you know, yeah. all these I think that's what they want. That. I want them to avoid that. Raiders. Pick 13, pick 44, pick 77, roughly $36 million in salary cap space. Uh, what are the moves that the Las Vegas Raiders need to make this offseason? Trade for Justin Fields. This is the <laughs> spot. This is the team to do it you're in quarterback purgatory uh it sounds like antonio pierce or harbaugh are the kind of top options over there i think keeping antonio pierce would make some sense to me if they keep the general manager he has ties coming from the bears with justin fields this is the team that needs an upside chance and i think that justin fields is the perfect opportunity to do that it seems like the consensus around the league is that justin fields a second third a uh, round pick, not the round one type, kind of similar to like the Sam Darnold discussion here. But I think this team would make some sense going in for Justin Fields. They were dead last in their percentage of runs that went for 10 plus yards. They were 29th 
in their percentages of passes that went for 20 plus yards. They need explosiveness. The Devontae Adams, he'll be in the middle of trade discussions the entire season. Right. It makes not a lot of financial sense for the Raiders to trade him. I think that they would only save yeah, two million dollars with 23 million dollars in dead money. So I think Devontae Adams will be there. This is the team that makes some sense to lean into the Justin Fields upside swing. Just on the head coach front, real quick, Diane Rossini was on the Dan Labatard show. And once again, she put out this quote that Mark Davis wants a star in Vegas. And it again goes back to John Gruden and mm -hmm. his father that they want a big name there. Um, if another team hires that big name, then Antonio Pierce is almost certainly the guy that they're going to keep. And if it's an Antonio Pierce offense, you know what you're getting. You're going to get uh, a lot of running the football. That is the mentality. So with that said, Andre James, their center, Greg Van Roten, their right guard, Jermaine Illuminor at right tackle, all played over 86% of the snaps, and they're all free agents. Okay? Oh, boy. Colton Miller is up for another deal because of you can move around some of his salary cap. And he's your starting left tackle. So again, if Antonio Pierce, it's I wouldn't say his offense, but let's say his mindset, his view of this team, mm -hmm. as we know, a lot of running the football, Justin Fields definitely fits in that 100%. And he can maximize some of the passing pieces that they have versus what they could do previously. <sighs> Keeping that same offensive line is pretty pivotal. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm glad that those guys stay healthy. They fit, even though, you know, Greg Van Roten and Illuminor and kind of been journeymen in some situations. But giving those guys contracts to me is a move that they must make this offseason. Is Justin Fields a big enough name? Obviously, the context is at head coach. But is that the offseason splash if you do retain Antonio Pierce? That would make some sense to me. So what I like about it, and obviously what Antonio Pierce has brought to this team versus Josh McDaniels is, again, that mentality, that toughness that camaraderie that bond mm -hmm. and you instantly saw it in max crosby to everyone josh jacobs and everyone down the list and it sounds like actually mark davis meets with a bunch of these players on a weekly basis and gets their feel for the team what are we hearing everything in chicago right now is that all of the teammates they love just them. love justin fields in fact dj moore went on amon ross st brown and equinemia st brown's podcast this week and said, we're going to trade the number one pick because D because Justin Fields is going to be our quarterback. I mean, that speaks to how much they love this guy. So from that perspective, he definitely fits it. All right, let's make it happen. Saints pick 14 also get pick 45 because of the Sean Payton trade. And I actually think they traded all the other ones away, <laughs> buddy. They don't have third or fourth round picks. They are also 72 million dollars over right. the salary cap at this point i do my best to keep up with how teams can maneuver in the offseason it's one of my favorite portions of the nfl calendar once again this team is running it back but i can be honest and tell all you people that i do not understand the salary cap well enough to understand how this team is even going to be able to put out an nfl roster <laughs> well how they're going to do it they let players like Michael Thomas walk. I want them to trade like Marshawn Lattimore because I want this team to go fully bankrupt. What How they do is they prorate all this money. But what that means is you're spreading out this contract over five-ish years. Well, right now, I just looked at the 2026 uh, cap situation. They have $10 million for Ryan Ramchek, $10 million for Marshawn Lattimore, $6 million to Derek Carr. Cam Jordan, who might be 48 years old in 2026, he's due for $5 million. Taysom Hill has $3 million. This so is 2026. It's, it's totally kicking the can. And I guess in that regard, Hayden, it's very different versus like the Washington Commanders, for example. They will yeah. never be able to be in a position where they have the most cap space available, even if they are picking in the top five, the right. top 10, because they ha are, are living by kicking the can down the road in the hopes of being competitive. But guess what? Again, another season, you're not in the playoffs. And they, in order for them to get into the uh, be cap compliant, they will have to restructure these some of these contracts and kick the can down the road. I only want them to do that when it's absolutely necessary. Don't try to middle this thing. Marshawn Lattimore is a perfect example. They can trade him away before all this money, this new money comes into play. Trade him because you're not trying to compete. 
no more. Like this is this is almost depressing. They've been running back the same roster for three, four years without the coaching staff that was once elevating everybody. Drew Brees, an elevator himself. You don't have any of those guys back. Enough already. Go completely bankrupt because even when you do go bankrupt, three years from now, you still are going to be paying some of the guys right. that aren't going to be on the roster. So stop doing that right now. Trade some of these key pa- key pieces and also trade down like that 14th overall pick. You don't have third and fourth round picks. I'm trading this pick for future picks. I want more second round picks because you need to fully reset. This team's so old and so bad and so unserious. And stuck with Derek Carr on top of it. Uh, if I had to pinpoint one position that they do have to fix, it's left tackle needs to be a priority because they actually drafted Trevor Penning in round one that same year that they traded up for two first round picks so they could take Chris Olave mm-hmm. and Trevor Penning. He was basically benched at the end of last season, wasn't called upon. And then Andrew Pete started there who had been a guard and they moved back out to left tackle. He's a free agent. So you really, as of this moment, have no left tackle that you trust out there, despite how much, again, you're talking about Eric McCoy, Cesar Ruiz, Brian Ramchek, all this money, picks, whatever, devoted to the offensive line. You still have a glaring need at left tackle here. Well, th- this team was built in the trenches. They were 28th in pass block win rate, according to ESPN, and then pass rush win rate, they were 31st. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> it's this. I would say uh, the next five years, the team that's least likely to show up in the Super Bowl, my I would pick the Saints. Yeah, and Nick Underhill does a great job at New Orleans Football. Um, it seems like every single day he is responding quote tweeting someone that's like Dennis Allen has to go when all these, Oh, there's a mystery team that is in on Bill Belichick or Mike Vrabel that hasn't fired their head coaches yet. Every saints fan is like, please let it be Dennis Allen. Who's out the door. (laughs) Nick Underhill is certain that Dennis Allen is going to be the head coach of this team in 2024. The Jameis Winston. We didn't talk about it on the, the, the Neil for Jamal Williams. And then like basically ran out Dennis Allen, the press screen conference. That was too real. It was great. Colts. Indomitus Colts pick 15, 46, and 82. They have roughly $58 million to spend. Hayden, this is the team that has a good coaching staff, that has a rookie quarterback contract that they are building around. What move must the Colts make in 2024? They need to get some speed on offense and replace Alec Pierce. We've seen what Alec Pierce has been the last two years. 1.2 1.2 and 0.8 yards per route run. He's a number four receiver. You can rotate him in. There's a role for Alec Pierce, but assuming they're Mike, Michael Pittman's coming back. That's a, a given. We don't even have to talk about that. I think that Anthony Richardson is going to be a quarterback that is going to absolutely sling the ball downfield. And I would like them to take a chance on a Brian Thomas or one of these downfield uh, rookies. And I would try to update that spot. If you can upgrade it with Brock Bowers, if he falls, upgrade your tight ends. But I think that this team needs one explosive option. Josh Downs and Michael Pittman are good players, but I don't think they have like the complete explosiveness that you really need to kind of take over and go on a Super Bowl run. But this is one of these teams that actually has the pieces in the next two, three years that can really get there. Cause I love Shane Sack and we like the upside with Anthony Richardson. I would just like to see one more player that fits what Anthony Richardson is good at, get him on the move, throw it downfield. I think that you can upgrade out Pierce. I'm really optimistic about the future of the Indianapolis Colts. Um, again, the simple answer of the move that they must make is resign Michael Pittman. Like he's going to be on these free agent lists that you look at for wide receivers. That is a non-negotiable. He is right. not making it to free agency. Um, and then actually they can pretty easily create even more salary cap by giving DeForest Buckner a new deal. Brain Smith, who's definitely a starting quality right tackle, a new deal. Ryan Kelly, who has flirted with retirement previously, but has already said he's going to come back, give him a new deal that opens up even more space this all season on defense for agents and Kenny Moore, Julian Blackman, and probably Grover Stewart can all come back. But I'm with you. The one name I, I brought up was Alec Pierce, who like is a contested catch downfield wide receiver. There's one of those in every single draft class. Mm-hmm. If you want those there's mm-hmm. out there in free agency too. So Michael Pittman can be even more in my opinion versus what he was this year. Josh Downs had a fantastic rookie season as a guy who was, spreading defenses horizontally and then he plays bigger than his frame but even from like the outside looking in i don't want people to think that oh this offense is going to look the same you just go from garner Minshew to anthony richardson that would be an improvement 
they would be in the playoffs if that was the case. But I bet Shane Sykin is itching to do even more than that. And if you still think, and you watch this channel, that Anthony Richardson is a project, that he's a year away from being a year away, you're going to be so wrong when we get to next September, next October. I cannot wait for the Anthony Richardson, Shane Sykin led Indianapolis Colts. AFC South. Pretty good. <laughs> Pretty good. Seahawks. Oh, buddy. Pick 16. They would have pick 47, but they trade away from Leonard Williams, who also needs a contract. Pick 78 and pick 81. Only $1.2 million to spend roughly right now. We know that Pete Carroll is no longer head coach. John Schneider is sticking around as general manager. It sounds like he's going to get full control for this entire season. So what move does he need to make, Hayden? I just don't want him to blame Geno Smith. Geno Smith will be 34 years old. They have a decision to make with the salary cap. He can be released and they would save $14 million against the cap. It would come with $17 million in dead money. He was not the problem with this team. He was the second best quarterback in pressure to sack ratio. That was really needed because both of his offensive tackles missed time this year. They were one of the worst teams when it came to pass block win rate. They were 25th, according to ESPN, when he was kept clean. Number one in big time throw rate, number four in yards per attempt. The offensive line injuries haunted Geno Smith. And more importantly, it was really the defense. The defense was 29th. In, against the pass they were 31st against the run they tried to trade for jamal adams they tried to make pieces yep. during the season don't blame geno smith keep geno smith under contract try to fix the defense with maybe a defensive minded head coach somebody like dan quinn the quote that pete carroll said during his i guess post career press conference uh we lost our edge to be great is what he said about the last couple of years. Wow. To me, that was a reason why he brought back Bobby Wagner, drafted a presence like Devin Witherspoon, other than him being an awesome player, tried to trade for Jamal Adams, who people thought had this aura about him. You know, some of those were hits. Take ways. Yeah. yeah. Some of those were hits. Some of those were misses. Right. Um, so on top of that, do you extend to create even more space? Because these are the questions you're going to have. $1.2 million right now. Do you extend DK Metcalf, Diggs, Draymond Jones? You have to basically re-sign Leonard Williams now, right? Mm -hmm. After giving up a second round pick. And so these are the decisions that John Schneider by himself, because it has been him, him and Pete Carroll next to each other this entire time. And then I had it exactly like you. That center guard and right tackle, they all were hits and misses at points this season. So... This team feels like it's close, but if things don't go their way, then they're kind of working in this ambiguous area as Geno Smith is now seeming like a new starter in the NFL, but he's on the wrong side of 30 right. and you're going to have to pay him a bunch of money after this year. The Basically, the contracts kind of work out the same way. Tyler Lockett and Geno Smith, you can release them and save basically the amount of money. I would release Tyra Lockett. Hopefully you get JSN in there. Just don't blame Geno Smith. You're not going to find a better quarterback than Geno Smith, especially after like Michael Penix got exposed in that last game. It seems like he's more of a day two pick. So I think you run it back with Geno Smith and hopefully you can get the defense sorted out. That's that was the problem. The Jamal Adams trade was just miserable. It was real bad. Miserable. It was real bad. Um, just quickly, because we have not spoken since Pete Carroll has is is out as head coach. Just a Quick note on the combo of this team, because what I loved about it, and it was really at the same exact time I was starting to work in football content professionally, mm -hmm. was how ahead of the game that Carol and Schneider were in highlighting um, athleticism when it came to the draft process. People thought it was spark scores. Let's just call it composite scores. He obviously brought that from USC. And at the time, I know this sounds crazy, at the time, they were way ahead of everyone else with that. Also with thresholds in terms of length, that cornerback, and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. Other teams obviously started catching up. The, I mean, even sparking the revolution of that defense side of the ball where every team tried to run single cover high, three. cover three, and no one really could do it the exact same way. It's because the pieces that they brought into it as well. So I always appreciated, one, being... You know, a step ahead in defensive game planning and 
that, but also roster management and roster building. Now, since having that edge over everyone else, they have struggled to nail those same, mm -hmm. you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth undrafted types at the same exact time. But I just want to give credit to the Seattle Seahawks because in some ways they were a bit of a dynasty for a period yes. of time. Definitely were. And then my note with Pete Carroll is just his personality and his ability to keep that energy for this long. I mean, I grew up as a USC guy, saw that 20 years ago, and he still has that juice. And on, on top of that, like we saw it after all the pieces kind of went away there was a lot of egos with that Legion of Boom team, and he was able to manipulate that for a very long time. And it sounds like those, like at points, was really toxic. But he kept those guys fighting for probably longer. It kind of scheme in the same ways with Mike Tomlin, just with like more energy on the sideline. Um, and he still wants to coach. We'll see what he wants to do with that. Um, but that energy and his personality to me is the reason why he's won at two different levels. Yeah, and again, don't want this video to be outdated. Dan Quinn seems like the most likely name destined for that area. I kind of think like Mike McDonald is a younger version of Pete Carroll in certain okay. ways. Uh, has obviously worked a little bit at the college level, never been a head coach, but just in terms of being a step ahead from a defensive standpoint. Yeah. Um, I mean, when you look at what the Ravens did this year and basically being five defenses in one <laughs> and how they're just constantly changing Insane. stuff, that would make a lot of sense to me. But yep. what a career. What a career. Jaguars. Pick 17. Then they give up either their second or third rounder if they sign Calvin Ridley to an extension or not. Jacksonville Jaguars have $14 million to spend. They fire their entire defensive staff along with the running back and offensive line coach. Hayden, what move must the Doug Peterson-led Jacksonville Jaguars make this offseason? You got to let Calvin Ridley walk. I've thought about this one for a while. Hayden, and I have the exact opposite, but okay, go ahead. This would, be, this would be perfect. So I just don't think that this team is truly that competitive. They have holes everywhere, and I'm not sure if they are in the position to kind of keep leaning into what they have right now and trade away now a second overall pick for the rights to pay Calvin Ridley, which would be a decent amount of money. Um, and he's already 30 years old. And Calvin Ridley, to me, was like a fine enough player, but is not the true number one right now, at, at least for a team that's trying to get where they want this Trevor Lawrence team to do. They reset with the coaching staff for the most part. Doug Peterson's still around. But this team can't block up front. The defense was super hit and miss despite having a lot of guys invested up there. They were 30th in penalty yards. They were 28th in turnover rate. This team just felt so immature for the entire season. And I think it's time to take the medicine. And I know that Calvin Ridley would make this next year's team definitely better. But is do you want to play for maybe 2025, 2026 and really kind of reset here? And that's where I'm at. Is I just think that this team's not that serious despite having Trevor Lawrence. And I would rather them actually fully reset rather than kind of like band-aiding this kind of roster that they currently have. Interesting. So I put myself in Trent Balky's shoes a little bit here. And Trent Balky definitely wants to win next season. Yeah, he wants sure. to have the best roster imaginable, right. you know, because he and Doug Peterson, probably if they miss the playoffs again, are definitely on the hot seat, right? Versus what we saw um, last year when they miraculously made the playoffs and had a great comeback on it. Um, I guess my point here with the Jacksonville Jaguars is the second and third rounder, it's it's not like they, it's just 32 picks difference. Right, right. It's just 32 picks difference. So it's not like, oh man, losing the second rounder. Okay, well, either you're going to lose the third rounder. So mm -hmm. like, to me, that is not the big sticking point here, right? It's more the the Money. contract. Right. It, it is the contract. To me, to win next season, this team in a perfect world would spend the number 17 overall pick on a true X outside wide receiver, okay? Then have Calvin Ridley as your motion guy, mm -hmm. right? Your movement guy. Have Christian Kirk as your slot guy. And then have 118 catch Evan Ingram out of nowhere <laughs> yeah. as as your tight end. Plus, this team did a bunch of cool two and even three tight end sets at this point. To me, that would be 
the best case scenario for this offense to have success next year. And you can get there by, you know, letting Cam Robinson go and hopefully having Walker Little play left tackle, even though he's been injured quite a bit of times. Anton Harrison, I think, is a building block along the right tackle spot. I just think it's so difficult in for agency. Heck, even in the draft, I know he's going to be eight years older than a bunch of these guys, but even find someone like Calvin Ridley in the draft that can create that separation and do and run the position like he yeah. can. And I just think hopefully you have a bit more luck and variances on the right sure. side in terms of touchdowns that it went against you this year for Trevor Lawrence and company. I think it was a perfect discussion on like the time horizons that these teams are trying to win. And I think yours is the more realistic scenario. These guys are trying to save their jobs. You keep Calvin Ridley, but I almost take what you just said, draft that receiver and then spend the money on the offensive line and on the defense, because I think it'll be a little bit cheaper. Is Calvin Ridley going to make 15, $25 million a year. Probably. Yeah. I'm not sure from if someone I want to be... he is from someone. He is this off season. But that's what I'm saying. I don't want, to be that it's, it's like the, it's like the christian kirk contract you can it's fine but it gets you at eight and nine you know like you're not winning the super bowl because you're spending christian kirk and calvin ridley money uh taking up a bunch of your cap space doing that i'm not sure now to your point i do think that there's a bit of overlapping skill sets here with calvin ridley christian kirk and evan ingram into like what they can bring to any theoretical offense um i mean this should be the last year that christian kirk is on this team too by the way because next year you can just jettison him and then by your token you're also jettisoning calvin ridley well and i'm drafting a wide receiver Keep right. Keon Coleman, and, a big wide receiver somebody like that we'll see um i also quickly want to say i've seen it a lot this week people are saying that this was like a miserable situation for trevor lawrence to be in this year like Look around the league. Yeah. Throw, this was fine. <laughs> throwing to, and I understand that they've missed time, and sure, the offensive line did not play great, but mm -hmm. throwing to Christian Kirk, Calvin Ridley, and Evan Ingram, and for he large can. portions of the season, it can get so much worse. Yeah, definitely. I just think there's, I think it just, it depends on the grade. This is not Super Bowl talent. This is not the worst talent. If this is 17th overall talent, and that's exactly how they ended up here. I just think that'd be a waste for Trevor Lawrence to stay in 17th overall yeah. talent. I would rather reset, and then hopefully you get to Super Bowl talent in 2026. Now, was the run blocking abysmal in the second half of the season? Yes. 100%. To me, can an offensive line coach fix that? And are you going to have to get rid of some of these pieces, maybe like Brandon Sheriff to get you know in salary cap and Cam Robinson we talked about? 100%. So like that has to get reshuffled. But... I am certainly of the opinion that talent, yes, does matter along the offensive line, but so does coaching on top mm -hmm. of it. And we didn't even mention that, like, really the move that they must make. They can't let Josh Allen go. Like, no, yeah. they obviously spent the first overall pick on Trayvon Walker, who let's say I mean, he's ascended a little bit. Like, right. he is getting better, but Josh Allen is the most feared pass rusher on that defense, and they can't let that get out of their grasp either. Bengals. All right, we close this out with the uh, Cincinnati Bengals. Pick 18, pick 49, pick 80. They actually have $68 million to spend. So Hayden, even with that $68 million mark in mind, my mind has immediately already taken T Higgins off this roster, Tyler Boyd off this roster. So what moves does this team need to make? You, so you think T, T Higgins is going to walk? I think T Higgins is for sure staying. See, I have been operating under the mindset for this entire season that this is the last time that we were ever going to see Joe Burrow plus Jamar Chase plus T Higgins on the same team. I would be stunned if T Higgins is not on the team. Burrow, Interesting. Burrow, Burrow said that the reason why he structured the contract the way he had is so he can keep guys. And he literally specifically said T Higgins. So I'm on, they have enough money to make the T Higgins stuff work at least on the franchise tag. That's a $21 million run it back one more year. So I was under, I was the opposite of you. I was working under the assumption that T Higgins is back. What I want them to do is draft Joe Burrow an offensive lineman. Since Burrow was drafted in 2020, they have spent a 46 overall pick on Jackson Carmen, who's like fine, 190, uh, 139th overall pick and 136th overall pick on offensive lineman. That is not enough. Obviously, you trade for or you get Orlando Brown at left tackle, but they will be moving on from Jonah Williams. They right. had to move him over to right tackle. He's a free agent. 
why don't we just draft this is crazy why don't we draft joe burrow an offensive lineman let's just let's just solve that issue it'll help the ground game in that same joe burrow press conference he said that they need to be able to run the ball and get some explosive runs well draft an offensive lineman that will help that on top of all the pass protection stuff joe burrow seems like he hasn't been healthy aside from that one season where he played like the mvp draft him an offensive lineman because they're keeping t higgins josh okay they can keep T Higgins. I'm with you. But it just has felt like that he has been gone from this team like all season long. Now, did I understand back in October or September that they were going to have $68 million to spend? No. Now, it's also one of these teams, Hayden, that all five of their highest snap players on offense were five starting offensive linemen. Jonah Williams is obviously going to leave, so that leaves a, a huge vacancy at right tackle. They were another one of these teams that went from truly awful to league average along the offensive line, and it helped. In a perfect world, the move that they make is put Joe Burrow in bubble wrap until week one and let us have like a normal offseason and training nice. camp where he actually like can get through it totally healthy. Um, can we walk down the path that T. Higgins does leave, though? Sure. Because then I think Tyler Boyd also does leave, and for cap purposes and for what he brings as offense, Joe Mixon probably leaves too. You're almost resetting this entire offense outside of Joe Burrow and J Jamar Chase, which is a pretty damn good combination. So, like in that regard, like Charlie Jones, Yoshi Voss, Chase Brown step up in some capacity, but they have enough money where they don't have to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, they could get spicy if running the ball is something that Joe Burrow really wants to do and spend a little more than anyone else on one of these still Saquon. awesome running backs, either Saquon or like Derrick Henry and like bring that element to this team that Joe okay. Mixon couldn't have. I think that Saquon, Derrick Henry are going to be available for eight to $10 million. And, I and like a one-year contract, make it a one-year deal and see if, if you franchise tag T Higgins, that's a one-year deal for him. Get a Derrick Henry in there and see what's going on. But this defense was well coached, but they were bad. They were just really bad. And the other part of that is DJ Reader is a free agent. He's obviously hurt. 30 years old and hurt. So there were already splits of him on and off the field. If he's definitely off the field, it is going down. And like Dax Hill and DJ Turner, who have been these first and second round picks recently, they right. need to step up quite a bit. Right. My, my other note with the offensive line thing is I think it's because the way Joe Burrow sees the field, he wants to get the ball out quick outs, all that type of stuff. RPOs. Sure. He's been like dead last in average depth of target since they took away the cover two stuff. I wonder if they felt a little bit more comfortable with their offensive line, if there would be a couple more instances where they can actually take some shots. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like I've missed that explosiveness from this Bengals offense since we saw like the absolute peak from Jamar Chase and maybe addressing the offensive line by him a couple extra seconds or where it's worth them actually taking a deeper drop back and give me a little bit more of a full send. Cause it's been a little bit since we've seen that version of the Bengals. Yeah. And I would say even their average depth of target this year was a bit skewed by the injury he had earlier this year. Cause it really was catch and throw, mm -hmm. catch and throw, catch and throw immediately. Fascinating team. The Bengals, we're either going to be right or wrong. I'm glad we get to cover our bases. Yeah. People like when we argue, so we need to keep it up. <laughs> um, we know that you've argued with us in the comments down below. I'm sure we didn't hit on every single thing that you wanted us to about your team. Guess what? We have eight months to do it. That's what the NFL offseason is all about. This was supposed to be just one. We hit on way more than one for each of these teams. Hopefully, you all enjoyed it. Um, enjoy the games this weekend. We already did oh, yeah. our preview show on all of that. Hit on some of the matchups. One thing to watch for from a schematic standpoint from every single team. Also, go watch Scheme, either for all of these head coach interviews, because there's one on Ben Johnson. There's one on Dave Canales. Some offense coordinators one. There's one on you know Shane Waldron. Heck, there's one on yep. Todd Monken and his offense. Anyways, we've got you covering every single thing that you need. Plus, we're going to be back here with two more shows next week, Kate. Yep, the games are going to be so sick. I mean, we can't so wait. Sick. Stafford, anyway. can't wait. All right, you all be good. Up the villa. Talk to y'all soon. See ya.